Evening, everyone. Well, glad you're here. My name is Rob Berger. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees of Stonewall Columbus, and it's my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, before we get to the program, I just want to make a couple of very brief remarks. Uh, I think I got a copy to everyone, but if not, on the back table on your way out, you want to grab a copy of the Pride Guide. It's Stonewall Columbus's schedule of everything that's going on this month. It's quite nice. You want to take a look at it. Also on the back table, Stonewall has a Pride brunch on the Sunday after the Pride Parade every year. And there are invitations on the back table. We're, we invite you to attend. It's at the Crown Plaza. Take a look at the invite if you're interested. Uh, you can give us a call for a ticket. Also, before we start the program, I want to make one other introduction. Uh, Stonewall hired a new executive director well, about a year, year and a half ago, Kate Anderson. And she's here with us tonight. Kate, if you want to take a stand. And um, I, I hope you've noticed some of the hard work she's been doing. Uh, trying to move the organization forward and get us in ship shape. So if you have any ideas or suggestions, corner her and tell her what they are. At any rate, uh, on to the, the purpose that we're here for, for tonight, I want to introduce you to Douglas Whaley, who's going to be giving tonight's presentation. Uh, Douglas Whaley has been a professor at Ohio State since 1976, a uh, professor here at the law school. He moved to Columbus at that time to come out of the closet. Uh, he was one of the original organizers of Stonewall Columbus, which at that time was called, uh, was called Stonewall Union. Uh, he was one of the original organizers in 1981, and uh, he was also a past board president. Uh, as you'll see tonight, he has excellent speaking skills, and those were util utilized early on by Stonewall in uh, having him uh, make presentations uh, at special events and interviews in the media and so forth. Uh, he's going to show you a clip uh, one of the first cable TV shows that Stonewall uh, aired in the spring of 1982. And in that clip, he's talking about the world history of gay rights. History, prior to the current movement, in the last couple of hundred years at least, the last great rise of gay rights occurred in Germany in the early part of this century. A man named Magnus Hirschfeld started a gay rights movement in Europe, in Germany and got adherence for hundreds of thousands of people. The gay rights movement spread throughout Europe. Hirschfeld started holding institutes. He built a great library of homosexual materials in an attempt to unravel this mystery of society. But the Nazis came, of course. And when the Nazis took over, we all know that they engaged in book burning. But what books did they burn? The first great book burning the Nazis engaged in was Magnus Hirschfeld's Sexual Institutes Library. They surrounded the building, and to the cheers of the crowds, the Nazi stormtroopers pulled the books into the streets and burned them. And there went the first great library ever assembled, attempting to study human sexuality. Destroyed. And then the Nazis went after the homosexuals first. Four years before the Nazis started attacking the Jews, the homosexuals started being thrown in concentration camps, where they were labeled with huge pink triangles, and were the most hated of all the prisoners. Even the other prisoners that were placed in concentration camps looked down on the homosexuals, and the Nazis began working them to death. They gave them meaningless tasks, like pushing huge, gigantic rollers aimlessly around the yard until they just dropped. Hitler and the Nazis managed to kill six million Jews, but they killed, it is estimated, about 600,000 homosexuals. Yet, when they talk about the Holocaust, when it was proposed recently that a memorial to the Holocaust mentioned homosexuals, it was, as usual, put down as an idea on the thought that homosexuals have no status whatsoever and have no desire to, have no need to be represented as victims of the Holocaust. But you know, when it was all over, when the American liberators came to free the camps, they let out the Jews and the gypsies and the political prisoners, the communists, and those who were mentally ill. But the homosexuals they classified as the real prisoners and they sent them off to prison, the real criminals, to finish their sentences. If you are the sort of person who thinks of yourself as liberated or enlightened, and you're the sort of person who would never make public jokes about blacks or Jews or women, but you nonetheless feel it's all right to tell fag jokes, think again. You may believe that you don't know any homosexuals, but of course they're all in hiding. 10% of all the people you know, that means hundreds of people you know, are homosexuals. They are your friends, your neighbors, those you work with, and even your relatives. And when you are telling your fag jokes, they won't think of you as enlightened. They won't think of you as liberated. Instead, they will label you in a different way. They will think of you as prejudiced. They will think of you as homophobic. And behind your back, they will put on you a label that none of us wants to wear. They will think of you as a bigot. 
Well, that was 1982. And let's see, let me get my bright spot here. Getting all my uh, equipment together. This is one of the smart classrooms at the Ohio State Law School. And for giving this lecture, which I did in March, I had to learn how to use it. I thought it would amuse you to see the buttons that we had from the various years. This is Stonewall Columbus's very new logo as of when, Kate? Well, we launched it prior to at launch the pride in this couple of weeks here. But some of these buttons go way back. Uh, these two, Val Faulkner, who's sitting right over there, created long ago, and then our logo changed, and we had various things, the 10th anniversary, and here's 1997, and I couldn't resist putting up these two, an army of ex-lovers cannot fail. And I'm not out, just out of the closet, I'm in the living room with my feet propped up. <laughs> The general theme of this lecture is not to give a complete history of gay rights in Columbus because my burnout occurred and what happened after that, other people have to tell that story. Uh, we're actually going to go from 1969 to about the early 1990s and at that point I stopped talking and sit down. I, want to I will mention the names of a number of very important people in the very early days uh, and I can't however mention all of the important people. I look around the room there are important people who uh, uh, whose stories ought to be told up here. The history of gay rights in Columbus involves hundreds of people working very hard at a time when it was dangerous to do, and we owe them all a great deal, and I wish I had time to tell you to name them all and to tell you stories about them all. There are great stories. One of the great fun things about putting on this lecture was I got to go back and drag out all the old videos and the photos, and I spent a lot of time on some of these things, as you will. I teared right up because, again, there, there were incredible moments. Uh, many of the people that we are going to lionize tonight were straight. Minorities cannot succeed without the dedicated effort of people in the majority, and a lot of our heroes here in Columbus are from the straight community. And uh, the reason that they participated in gay rights was they looked around and thought that what was currently going on was simply wrong. And with that kind of ethic, they plunged into the battle when it was dangerous for them, when it was politically dynamite for them. And we'll talk about some of those people as we go through also. Well, Columbus in the 1970s, the uh, climate of the world changed dramatically in the 60s when the baby boomers came of age, now they're all about to retire, but in that day they took over the world. And all over the world you had, in effect, teenagers and people in their early 20s running absolutely everything. The, uh, the fight for equality in the African American community had really started in the, 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 in the 1950s, but the baby boomers came along and said, let's have fairness for absolutely everyone. So in addition to racial equality being important, suddenly we had the feminist movement and they were out there burning their bar, uh, bras and so forth, and it became inevitable that at some point, even the lowliest of the low, the gay community, would start to think that, hey, we ought to step out of the closet. We ought to be able to fight for our rights. And so the history of Columbus's gay movement actually starts in New York City with the history of the modern gay movement all over the country with the Stonewall Inn rights. Stonewall Inn was a gay bar in Greenwich Village in New York City, and let me get my dates right here on Friday, June 27th, 1969, Judy Garland had died, so people were not in a good mood. And when the police raided the bar, the riots started. It started, there were various arguments about this, but apparently with the lesbians throwing the first punch, and then the drag queens jumped in, and three days of rioting ensued, and that led to the formation of a large number of agreement, uh, of organizations. Uh, Gay Pride Month, which we're in right now, celebrates June of 1969. That's the, why we hold it in June. And that's why the Gay Pride Marches are typically at the end. Again, the first date was June 27th. The, uh, we had gay groups here in Columbus that started springing up almost immediately because now it was okay to vent your anger. And I got to looking at the tapes and so forth. I think what, what um, fuel most of us in the early days was anger. At some point, you weren't going to take it anymore, and that led to the formation of organizations. In Columbus, I, I, I've been doing some reading and so forth, and there were some interesting named ones in Columbus. There was Gay Women Safonsified. It's got to be from Sappho, the poet from Lesbo of ancient days. 
gay women sponsor us. But the big one in Columbus was Gay Activist Alliance, right? It formed uh, right here on campus, and that was the young people's group. And uh, John Quigley of the OSU Law Faculty was its advisor when it was formed right in 1970, so that's a year after the Stonewall riots. Um, Craig Covey, who will, is a name that will figure much in this story, was a, a student at Ohio State, an undergraduate, and he became president of the organization from 77 to 79 and changed the name to the Gay Alliance. Val, you were involved in this too, weren't you? In those it's days. right when Craig was. Yeah. Right when Craig was. Were you president of the organization? Then? No, I was just a member of it. Okay. Um, and changed the name to Gay Alliance because gay activists uh, sounded like it was too uh, much of a, uh, a stretch for some people, I suppose is the way the place to say it. Now, let me uh, tell you all about the battle in 1973. The legislature in the state of Ohio passed a, uh, a bill that completely changed the criminal laws of the state of Ohio, and that forced most, leg most municipalities to change their criminal laws so that they would be in accordance with the new state laws. And Tom Moody was the mayor here in Columbus, and rather than do this in-house, he was talked into appointing a 17-person board to rewrite the Columbus ordinances so they would be in accordance with the new state laws. And one of the people that they put on the board was John Quigley. Now, John Quigley was an incredible person to put on the board. He, uh, John was never shy about throwing himself into major battles whenever it was possible to do from then until this very day, and he's still on the law school faculty here. He is one of those straight people to whom we owe a great deal. And let me show you some photos of John here. And here is John Quigley as he looks now uh, today. I asked him for one of his professional photos. And you know, he's getting up in here as we all are, but let me show you what he looked like back in the 70s. Here we have John. <laughs> in the top photo, he's in Cuba talking to the a judge in Havana. And here he's in Vietnam. Oh no, Cuba's at the bottom. Vietnam is at the top. John, at some point, after Vietnam won the, uh, the war in Vietnam, was asked to, his, one of his areas of specialty is criminal law. So John was asked to help draft the criminal laws of Vietnam. And he stopped me in the hall one day and he said, I stopped them from making sodomy a crime. I said, thanks, John. But you know, just little things like that, we owe an awful lot to John for. Um, all right, wandered away from my notes. Okay, the battle in city council. Uh, John decided that as part of the rewrite of the city ordinances, we ought to change the discrimination protection, so it included sexual orientation for the first time, protecting people from being discriminated against on the basis of public housing, public, accom uh, housing, public accommodation, and employment. Well, uh, and I got an email from John. I told him, give me the details of this, because I wasn't in Columbus for another three years. And John's email says, some local groups lobbied the mayor to set up a broad-based com commission rather than do the revision in-house. As a result, Moody agreed to appoint a commission with representatives from various local groups, but with quite a few officials from various city agencies. There were 17 in all. We met at a union hall on the east side. When I made the proposal about inclusion of sexual orientation and the penal provisions on discrimination, one city official became apoplectic. Uh, and you could see why, this led to uh, the commission approving a broad ordinance protecting discrimination on this basis and put sexual orientation in there with all the usual minorities. It was passed by Columbus City Council on November 26, 1973, uh, and this caused a huge public outcry. The Columbus Dispatch, which in those days was very homophobic, published an article on the front page of the city section that said, People must hire homosexuals. You know, just let's start off with uh, get this this argument off on a, a nice, even, uh, free basis. And uh, the city attorney is quoted in this article as saying that it promotes homosexuality and will cause problems with the police department and the fire department and so forth. And there were various groups like the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, Bill Swad, president, who <laughs> jumped right into the fray and argued that this was also a bad idea leading uh, the mayor, Tom Moody, to veto the entire rewrite 
And what he said was that 95% um, of it was good, but the other contained a drop of poison. So now the question was, it went back to city council, they had to reenact it with what he hoped would be a watered down version. And city council did pass the new ordinance in January of 1974, uh, but they had eliminated protection for employment. The protection still existed for uh, uh, public accommodation and for housing, but no longer for employment. So that became the next battleground. Were we ever going to be able to get employment protection by the Columbus City Council? Now we move on to the creation of Stonewall Union. There had been stirrings throughout Ohio for years. There was a march in Cleveland, and it had to be 1977 for various reasons, where there were about 300 people that marched. And there was one here in Columbus in 1981, which is the year Stonewall was founded, but Stonewall did not yet exist, where about 130 people marched around the state house. Is that right? Actually, there was a church. The moral majority was trying to... No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to get to the moral oh. majority. I'm talking about a oh, march around the state yeah, house. Okay, I remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, the... Uh, in... Okay. Well, let's get to it. Jerry Falwell, famous uh, minister and creator of the moral majority, decided to come to Columbus and get a chapter of moral majority up and running here in Columbus. And this caused various liberal groups to be all excited. There was no gay group in this day, but a number of gays from the Gay Activist Alliance and that sort of thing got together and decided to uh, protest along with the other liberal groups. And this worked. Fowell never did establish a moral majority uh, a chapter here in Columbus. But that led the, uh, the people who had been working on getting the gays there uh, to decide that it was time that we had a gay activist group uh, right here in Columbus that would work on civil rights protection and, and the other kinds of things that go on. And amongst them was Val Bob Martin, who is sitting right here, Craig Huffman, who I've been trying to get a hold of, uh, but who was unable to attend, and Craig Covey, who became the first executive director of Columbus. And these people, let me say a few words about each of them. First of all, Val. Here, one of my friends said to me, Val Fogg Martin is just cool. And you're going to see him here, a younger version, in just a moment we get to the first Pride Parade. Uh, Val uh, was always very smart and very articulate and very personable and one of the nicest guys on the planet, so it was hard to demonize him. So we used to, used to throw Val out there to, to, uh, as a representative. And then there was Craig Huffman. Now, Craig Huffman was another piece of cake. Craig Huffman was our bomb thrower. Uh, and Craig was forever being thrown out of the gay bars downtown because he'd go down and accuse them all of being homophobic because they didn't support Stonewall enough. And uh, Craig said exactly what he meant to say at all moments and could not be in any way censored. And you need people like that in your organization, though you have to watch them sometimes. <laughs> in the early days of the, the gay pride uh, television show, John Glenn made a run for the presidency and had lots of problems when he suddenly announced he wouldn't hire gays, and Craig Hoffman went on the TV show and explained in great detail why uh, uh, John Glenn was an evil person. And, uh, you know, when you're trying to make friends, that sort of thing happens. Then Craig Covey, Covey who was, became the first executive director, you will see much of him. Let's see if I've got a photo of crap here. Um, he doesn't turn up on the videos until later in the lecture. Um, yes, this is a point of view. This is Craig Covey, and we're at some, I think this is the March in Washington some years ago, and of course this is me, and this is my lover of 12 years, Jerry Bundy, who also turns up in our story at some point, uh, because he became president of Stonewall also. The, uh, Val and the two Craigs decided that it was time to have this organization, so what they did was they decided, they named it, aren't you the person who named it Stonewall so, Union? And started going around to the bars and putting up signs and urging people to join up, and I walked into the trends one night and Val was sitting at the booth, and this has to be in very early uh, times, because I signed right up and was able to attend the first meeting of Stonewall uh, Union. Uh, and these people dragged in their lovers, too. Steve Wilson, Keith McKnight, and Dennis Blow, they had no choice about it, and they were dragged in and did yeoman work. So again, I don't have time to mention this. Steve Wilson was a very effective treasurer, for example, for a long period of time. Um, the first board meeting was on October 7th, 1981, and the reason I know that 
that sounds uh, un, uh, very precise is I keep a diary. And so I've been going back and dragging out my diary, and I can tell you what dates we did things. Our first general public meeting was at Trends on October 29th in the evening, late in the evening. You know, if you want gays, you better come out particularly in those days, late in the evening. Uh, Craig and Val say, uh, shared the primary leadership at first, but Craig eventually did become the first executive director, serving there until he left office in 1985. Moved up to Detroit, where he runs the state's AIDS organization, and is now an openly gay member of the Ferndale City Council, and turned up on National Public Radio. Uh, not that long ago. I tried to get him down here for this lecture, and I had a discussion with him today, and he had, unfortunately, one of the people on his city council uh, ran into a wall with a blood alcohol uh, count and killed himself, so Craig is involved in dealing with that unfortunate tragedy. Um, well, the early days of Stonewall, I mean, we had a board, but we didn't quite yet have a constitution, and, and we were just pretending to be an organization. We met typically at various people's houses, and a lot of times over at Craig's, where we were covered with cat hair and sitting on the floor licking envelopes and hoping we had enough money for stamps. Money was the very biggest problem in the early days. We didn't have money for stamps, so we'd pass the hat. And we tried desperately to keep the organization afloat for yet a little bit. Elliot Fishman, who is one of the uh, graduates of this law school, uh, and one of my former students, uh, we, Elliot had done fundraising for the Jewish community, so we put him into service and sent him out to uh, with hat in hand to see if we couldn't talk the A gays into turning over some money to Stonewall Union. Um, and, you know, those were, those were pretty desperate days. I can tell you in the leadership currently of Stonewall that it almost failed as an organization about 50 times in the early days. I mean, it came real close. Sometimes these were battles over turf, sometimes they were personality clashes, but typically the reason was we didn't have any money. And uh, when two years ago, Stonewall honored the 20th, it was the 20th anniversary of Stonewall, so they honored the 20 people they thought were most important to Stonewall's creation. And uh, one of these people was Craig Huffman, of course, since he was one of the founders, and he was unable to make it. He was trapped at the airport in Washington, D.C., and he called me at 8 in the morning, though I'm not a morning person, on the morning of the Gay Pride Parade, when we were all supposed to ride around in cars, and uh, people wouldn't know who we were, but we'd wave. And <laughs> Craig said, well, Doug, I can't make it. Tell them all how sorry I am. And he said, but you know, I'm not real sure I want to be honored for something that I did 20 years ago. I said, oh, yeah? Do you know what Stonewall's budget is currently? He said, no. I said, $400,000. And there was a long pause on the other end of the phone, and then Craig said, oh, my. And again, the comparison between what you people are doing now and the cat hair problem days, uh, those are gone. Now, we, we decided to throw a press party. New organization in Columbus, surely this is major news. So we went around and we beat the bushes and we talked and we called in all the chips that we all had with the various members of the media, and they promised the show, the television people, the newspaper people, all decided to show, and on November 20th, 1981, at my house, which did not have cat hair, and is up in Worthington, we decided to throw a party and we cleaned the place and we had alcohol and all that. Nobody showed from the press. Uh, nobody came. And uh, that was a huge disappointment. We all got drunk, and it was one hell of a party. As I <laughs> now it came time. That was this was all the fall of 1981, and among the things we decided to do was pull off a parade in June of '82. So our first parade was June of '82, and we didn't know if we'd be able to do it. The problem with trying to get a parade together is you've got to have people, and we didn't know if anyone. I mean, anyone would come out and uh, be in the parade. Eject one, stick in another. I mean, now, the current estimate is we're going to have 60,000 people in a couple of weeks marching here in Columbus. But in the early days, we were worried we wouldn't have anybody. You know, it would be Craig and Val and, uh, the two Craigs and Val and I and our various lovers and so forth and uh, a few friends and that would be it. And when the people came, it was astonishing. Craig, who always inflated the numbers, and I talked to him on the phone the other day, he was telling me about the gay pride march up in Detroit, and I said, oh yeah, what numbers are they? And he told me, I said, now what's the real number? He said, okay, no, it's really this and that. Yeah. But in the early days, he was always playing around fast and loose with those numbers. Well, we actually counted them. 
was like 825 people marched that first day. And I pulled out the tape the other night and sat there and watched the whole march. And it was amazing. They came from all over Ohio and they were all angry and they were all very brave. We had a group that marched with paper bags over their head because they were terrified of the, what was going to happen to them once they were uh, this much out of the closet, but they marched anyway. And here is a little snippet of the press coverage of that event. Gay Pride Parade, Jim Schroeder reports. Stonewall Union, a gay community organization formed in response to the moral majority, sponsored today's event. The rally started in Goodale Park, where a small group of protesters came to ask the participants to change their ways. We've come down here today to let you know that being a lesbian is wrong in the sight of God. We've come down here to tell you that being a homosexual is wrong in the sight of God. But the gays were not here seeking forgiveness. Rather, they are looking for dignity and equal rights. In the past few years, has the harassment of gays increased or decreased? In Columbus, it has gotten progressively better. In Columbus, we're one of the few cities in the United States to have uh, protection in housing and protection in public accommodations. And uh, what we're working on now is to get protection in job employment so that we can't be fired for being gay. The parade stepped down Park Street through the downtown area ending at the state capitol. Now in the late 70s, many gays came out of the closet, but the march today was also a show of support for those who fear coming out of the closet. There are still a lot of people who uh, are in the closet and who are afraid to come out, and these things like this, a parade like this, we're hoping will bring people together and realize that they can't come out of the closet and be open about their feelings. The speakers at today's rally encouraged gays to be proud of themselves and to work through the political system to gain the things they want the most, respect and human rights. Little snippet they showed there of me, as as Rob Berger said when we started, the the Stonewall in the early days, for the most part, it was college kids. That's what we're dealing with, and here I was, this older fogey, and on the law school faculty, and I always was uh, willing to stand up in front of, of groups and talk. So Stonewall used to drag me out and did up and through the early 90s, whenever there was trouble, gays in the military. Suddenly I was back on television and helping out with that sort of thing. But my Again, I was fueled by a lot of anger, and my own personal story I won't tell you much about. I, I actually did tell that here in the law school classroom, oh, back in the, <coughs> it had to be the late 80s, we had a lot of homophobic incidents going on at the law school, and I'm a pretty popular member of the faculty, so I gave a lecture called Understanding Homosexuality and talked about my own uh, uh, progress in this event. But in any event, um, one of the things I was useful for was battling those preachers. Um, that Richard Dean, who you just saw there, he was at all the gay pride marches, and for all I know, still is. And he'd walk up with these Bible yelling and so forth, and when I want to use it, I have a big voice! And I'd get right up next to him and I'd say, this man is teaching hatred and using the Bible, shame on you! And I'd, uh, I'd tell him, okay, the crowd, let's go. God loves gays! God loves gays! And we get everybody chanting and trying to drag and drop. Uh, get that man so he couldn't be hurt. And he did not like seeing me come uh, up to him wherever he was as the years progress. All right, now enter the great Rhonda Rivera. Now, the history of gay rights in the state of Ohio, and indeed much of the Midwest, uh, has to do with the great Rhonda Rivera. I one time told the San Francisco Chronicle that her name should be spelled in all capital letters and with three exclamation points. And those of you who knew her know exactly what I meant. Rhonda took over the movement. It, it tottered along and was doing fairly well. And in the fall of 83, which is two years after its founding, Rhonda became the president of the board. And Rhonda did things in a way I'd never seen. She has a genius for organization. Let me show you her, her picture. Um, my point. just failed me the key moment. Behind you. Behind you. The pointer. Um, here she is. This is that. This is from the uh, Columbus Dispatch of a couple of years ago, and here is her <laughs> current photo. But here's what she looked back back in the '70s. This is 1978. I know for various reasons, and she's smiling here. This is her son Robert. 
And Robert was 11 years old in this picture, but he's going to turn up on a video clip in an important way when he's 17, so six years later. The very cute little child in the middle is my son, Clayton, then age five. And uh, Rhonda is more like his godmother in these days. Um, well, well, Rhonda has, is a genius at organizational skills and at motivating people, and even though she hates public speaking, she is a splendid public speaker. Stonewall brought her back two years ago and she wowed the crowd talking about the early days of Columbus. She said the men were all involved in uh, organizational, right, but it was always social organizations, mostly for sex, and that uh, the women were involved in trying to run meetings without using Robert's Rules of Orders because that was the patriarchy, and she said so, and her best line of two years ago at the Stonewall. Uh, uh, dinner was the, uh, she said, so the men were trying to reach climax and the women were trying to reach consensus. <laughs> and then along came Rhonda. We had, I was re-elected to the board because I'd been, I'd been away for a year teaching at the University of California Hastings Law School when I came back, got elected to the board, and the first meeting of the board under Rhonda Rivera lasted four hours. And it was right here in the law school, because she was a member of the faculty of the law school. She joined in 1976, the same year I came, but I had been here since January, and she didn't come till September. And all of a sudden, I had the students, the gay students, where's Richard, where'd you go, in my office, saying, lesbian, there's a lesbian. Uh, she just joined the faculty. So I invited her out to lunch, and I'll have to tell you that story after a while, but Rhonda then took over, and that four-hour meeting went by in a flash. It was thrilling. At the end, we were all holding hands, and and Rhonda had inspired us, and it was exciting to have her leadership. And uh, Emerson once said that an organization is the shadow of one man. Uh, if we had to pick one person, it would be Rhonda. But actually, it was Rhonda and Craig as a tag team that really kept things going through the early days until the organization had enough legs that it could run itself. And the two of them did not always get along, but they, uh, they were giants. And uh, Rhonda led us all, and she would be come into my office. Doug, I want you to do this. Doug, get out your checkbook. I want you to do this, and I want you to join this organization. I want you to do this. And we all did what Rhonda said. The governors, Dick Celeste, signed the executive order. He was not given a choice. And the president of the university signed the protection for gays here on, at the university level. And she is down there uh, uh, with all the politicians and so forth, paying court to Rhonda. And she wrote major law review articles uh, about gay rights and the, the legal effect of being gay. Um, indeed, here at the university, the code word for are you gay is, do you know Rhonda Rivera? I mean, that, that was how we, we found one another in those days. Um, let's see. Uh, there were others involved in these battles in these days. Robert Haverkamp is sitting right over here down below Val. He drafted, Robert is a big wig in the upper administration here at OSU, but he is one of the graduates of the OSU Law School, as indeed a lot of people are in this story. And Robert drafted the first constitution that uh, Stonewall ever had, the one that required gender parity and, and so forth. Um, in those days, we did an awful lot of public appearances. And uh, Craig and I, and Rhonda and I, and Craig and Rhonda uh, were on the talk shows, and where we were uh, interviewed, and on the radio programs. And Craig and I had a regular dog and pony show for those four-hour radio shows, which are call-ins. I mean, some of those would really get going. Now, what I do for a living is stand in this very classroom with a room full of very intelligent people, the law students of our day, and with, through a Socratic dialogue, question and answer, we we, we find the light. Well. I was able to use those same sorts of talents in the, the discussions on the radio, because people would call in, and here is what I have now said for years, but I think is true and I like it as part of this tape. Here is what the far right and the religious right and all those conservatives who hate gays and so forth don't understand. They're on the wrong side of the morality of this issue. And that's what surprises them over and over again. And people who are in their ranks suddenly go silent as they learn their uncle, their child, their father, and so forth is gay. And uh, they keep losing these battles because it is simply wrong to do what society has always done. And you could talk people around to that if you kept pushing at them. One of, uh, I, have, I, have, I meant to bring, I thought about bringing one of the audio tapes of some of the great moments from the radio shows. One of my favorites is Craig, a woman calls in Craig and says, 
what do you do when you see a beautiful woman? And Craig says, I say to myself, I wish I were a lesbian. <laughs> I woke up on the air. One of these call-ins, we were, of course, forever having to battle the Bible. And we had a lot of biblical discussions. And after one of these had gone on and on, uh, I worked the woman who called in into saying, well, I don't believe that God would create people as gay and then make it a sin. I said, I don't believe that either. Thank you for calling. And we pulled the plug on her. Um, there are a lot of things that I will tell you about about Stonewall as we go through. There are things I am not going to talk about, like the disastrous retreat in February of 1985 where the organization also <laughs> almost failed over a retreat trying to get us together instead. Oh, heck. Here was one of the main victims right over here. All right, it is now time for the 1984 ordinance battle. We had protection on the basis of public, uh, com uh, public accommodations and housing, but not employment. So it was decided that we would go to city council because city council then had five Democrats and two Republicans on it. And Craig and various other people, Rhonda, were down there campaigning. One of the Republicans, Dorothy Teeter, uh, said to Rhonda, the time has come. I will vote for it. And the other Republican was Arlene Shoemaker, currently one of Franklin County's commissioners in those days on city council. And Arlene had loudly touted in the press that she was in favor of gay rights, a Republican woman. And this was all over the press, and she was all over the news saying the time has come for this ordinance to go through. So Arlene was on board. That gave us two Republicans. The president of the city council in those days was Jerry Hammond. And he will turn up here with the word president in front of him. He is one of those people that the gay community owes an awful lot to who is straight. Jerry Hammond was introduced the ordinance and pushed for it, and he was and is a powerful presence in the city of Columbus. Also on the city council was another African American, Ben Espy, a name to conjure with then and now in the political community. And the question was, would Ben Espy vote for the ordinance? Because we had uh, 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 other people on board, and Espy was an important vote, and he was equivocal. And we kept pressing his aide, a young man named Michael Coleman, uh, a name you may have heard, our current mayor, was his aide in those days. And Michael Coleman said, well, we're not sure. We have some problems. What are the problems Rhonda wanted to know? Rhonda was willing to work with all of this. And uh, uh, we got down to the point where we predicted that the vote, when it came around, was going to be um, five to two. And it was five. Here is, we were so naive, it should have occurred to us that this sort of thing was going to happen, but we did not see it coming. Of Jesus Christ, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I have brought you the word of God, and I have told you what it says, and in my opinion, and God's opinion, as I stand before you today, homosexuality is an unclean practice, as the Father God has said it plain and simple, and they should not be forced to be hired in to be around our children to spread diseases that have no cure. It's foolishness. It's foolishness. You don't let a leper person in among clean people. You quarantine them. You keep them outside. You quarantine smallpox and herpes, AIDS, and these various diseases that have stemmed out of the homosexual community should not be forced to be placed among God's clean people. The atmosphere, Columbus City Council, if you've never been down there, uh, they meet up in the front and they've all got their little booths with their names in front of them. And the room itself is quite large. There's a downstairs seating area. And they, then there's an upstairs balcony, which is quite uh, spacious also. And it was packed to the point where it was standing room only. And they had bust in huge numbers of people from surrounding areas, lots of churches, and about two thirds of the crowd all had brought their Bibles and the atmosphere and the gay community, about the rest of the third, we were all cowered off on the side and, and scared. The atmosphere got to the point where it looked dangerous to be there. Indeed, Rhonda was escorted in and out by bodyguards. And I got up and stupidly said some things that it never occurred to me until later that it might have been dangerous. So here is a little bit of the testimony that uh, various people had on either side. Our next speaker is Reverend Lapish.
name is Tim Layfish, reside at Chase Avenue. They told us in college that we had to start all of our sermons with a joke. And the joke is that I'm even here today. I can't believe that this great city of Columbus is actually considering the passage of such a bill of this nature. I have two reasons. I'll no doubt be redundant, but I'll try not to be of my preceding fellow uh, believers. First of all, I believe if we pass this issue, it's going to give Columbus a bad name. Who in the world wants Columbus to be known as the gay capital of the Midwest? It used to be that Columbus was the all-American town. Mom, apple pie, and things of this nature. How dare, how dare we even think of putting such an ordinance into this effect here that would cause us to think any different. Number two, we believe if this issue passed, homosexuals from surrounding states will flood Columbus. They'll realize that they're protected by law, and they'll flood here, and they'll bring their AIDS disease with them. And we don't want it. We believe it passed. This bill will cause prospective businesses to back out of Columbus. Knowing that they can be sued, fined, put in jail if they refuse to hire a homosexual because they believe it is wrong. It will in fact put some businesses out. Do you think, do you think if this is passed and a daycare center has a homosexual that people who have trusted that daycare center are going to keep their kids in there? They're going to yank them and out of business go to daycare center. We believe it passed. Many of the young professionals that Columbus has been attracting over the past 10 years will pass because their children will have to be reared in a school system that has known and avowed homosexuals and lesbians to teach them a lifestyle that they do not want for their children. We believe in past, this bill will allow homosexual lesbian teachers in our school and will create a hysteria type atmosphere among the parents whose children may have to shower in front of a known homosexual and go to the bathroom in front of a known homosexual or lesbian and we don't want it. We also know that homosexuals cannot reproduce. They must recruit. And the best place to recruit is going to be the daycare and the public school system. Have you ever thought of this? Why is it that 75% of criminals going into prison are straight, but come out gay? We, we believe, if passed, this bill will exert an undue amount of stress on our fire department and police department. No one has mentioned that yet. I talked recently with Assistant Riley, the fire department, and Lieutenant Cato from the police department, and both giving their opinions on the subject of greed. If passed, this bill would hinder the effectiveness and hurt the morale of their respective, respective departments, especially the fire department, because they have to live, shower, change in the same atmosphere, and they are against it. messed up. We need their effectiveness on the job. It will be reduced by men who work there. We believe that past this bill will flood our already overburdened court systems with ad additional unnecessary cases, resulting in thousands of taxpayers' dollars being wasted. We believe that past this bill being an extremely poorly written amendment, sexual orientation, what does that mean? Does that give rights to child molesters? Are you going to give rights to rapists? We believe that this passed, you're going to open the door to every type of sexual per perversion there is. We believe that this bill is passed. It would force daycare centers, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Big Brother pro uh, programs, churches, and eventually other community organizations. Eventually, they'll be put out of business because they have to have these type of clientele. In conclusion, in St. Paul, Minnesota, the council there had a similar resolution. The overwhelming opinion was against it, but yet they passed it. The concerned citizens of St. Paul, Minnesota then put this on the ballot and defeated it four to one. And I'll tell you what, the climate in Columbus is against this.
She wants an immortal climax in Columbus. I believe that this path, you will be committing political suicide. of this council. Some council in Columbus is going to pass this ordinance. There will come a day when this will seem as silly a matter as, as discriminating against blacks or women. But uh, the question is, is this an act of political courage that this council can pull off? It will be very hard to do because you're going to face a group, you're going to support a group that is much discriminated against. But I like to think that the city of Columbus stands for the idea that you may not discriminate on the basis of job, on the basis of a uh, sex partner, and that you can discriminate only on the basis of whether or not people are doing their job. Rhonda Rivera. I actually am here in two persons tonight. My name is Rhonda Rivera. I live at 385 East Schreier. My profession is attorney and legal scholar. I cannot remember, although I'm a relatively well-known public speaker, when I have felt so deeply and cared so much, so you will excuse me. Over 54 cities in this nation already have this legislation. It's not that wild. One state has voted to protect gay people all over with regard to their employment rights. We have four executive orders in states around this country. There is, however, no federal law. I've seen in the newspaper that some people think there is, and I'd be happy if they would just show it to me. There is no state law that protects people from discrimination in their employment. I would like to point out that we have a very interesting equal protection argument here, however, in Columbus. Under the executive order issued by Richard Celeste, every state employee in this city is protected with regard to their sexual orientation. By the rules of the University of the State of Ohio State University, every professor and staff person there is protected. Every student at Ohio State is protected. But other people in your bailiwick are not protected. So they are suffering from the unequal protection of the law if you fail to do this. Our Constitution mandates equal protection of law for every citizen, regardless of whatever particular status they choose or comes to them. If you are a Jew or a Roman Catholic or an Episcopalian, it is not something you are born with. You, cut, you choose it. If you think homosexuality is chosen, it's no different. However, the study showed that we do not choose the lives that we are given by God, and therefore, we should have a right to be employed. Columbus already protects us in housing and public accommodation. How are we to afford the housing if we cannot have jobs? How are we to go out and enjoy the public accommodations if we cannot earn a living? I have heard people say there is no need. I am a private attorney. In the eight years that I have been here, I have had three to five calls every week of people who have suffered discrimination in this city. And I had to tell them, there is nothing I can do. Years ago, when the Irish landed in this country, there were signs that said, no Irish need apply. Years ago in this country, when a black person went in for a job, they were told there were no jobs for them. And I can remember when I left law school in 1968, there was no job for me because I was a woman. Don't fail to include everybody so they have a right to a job, regardless of any status or condition. They have a job on merit. I would like to introduce to you my son, who is 17 years old and is about to graduate from a Columbus public school. He's going to finish my, my time. My name is Robert Rivera. Um, I go to Columbus Alternative High School. And uh, I guess one of the things that I'm really pleased with about Columbus is that I can go to a school where I feel happy. Columbus Alternative is a place where people can go when they don't feel quite right with the Columbus public school system as it stands now. People feel ostracized in schools, and ostracism is a tough thing to deal with. It makes people hurt. I've watched my mom for 17 years. <sighs> this hurts. What I'd like to say to you tonight is that we're all opening our hearts to you, and we're putting them on a silver platter so that you have two choices. You can cut it, or 
you can love it. That's all I can say. Our final speaker is Mr. Covey, and Mr. Covey, I would ask you to, to limit yourself to three minutes. Mr. Covey. Our final speaker, I have a proponent. Thank you. You know me. You know that I have worked hard for the past nine years in the city of Columbus to make this a better city for all of us. Now I want to ask you something about wasted talent. How much talent has been wasted, was wasted for over 150 years when women did not have the votes and had no rights? Why did women have to suffer in the United States of America? How much talent was wasted for 200 years when black people of this country were denied their rights and their freedom? Why did millions of black people have to suffer in the United States of America? How much talent has been wasted for hundreds of years up to today when gay and lesbian people are oppressed, when we're denied our rights and we're, we're kept in fear? How long do we have to suffer in this country? Is there discrimination in this city? If there is anyone in this room who has ever been fired or denied work because they are gay, if there's anyone here in this room who has ever been in fear of being gay, if there's ever anyone in this room who has ever suffered abuse or discrimination because they are gay, if you believe that the time is now to end this waste of people, would you silently stand up? As voters, as workers, as citizens, as decent, hardworking Americans in this city, as people, we ask you to vote yes. We now... Well, they were now ready for the vote, and this was the big moment, truth to be told. First, Ben Espy, um, who we've been worried about, asked for Rhonda to come back up to the lectern, and he started quizzing her on the details of the ordinance. And he said, is it true that the enforcement mechanism, the, the entity, the commission that was supposed to enforce it, no longer exists? And she said, yes. And he said, well, then, if we pass this, nobody can enforce it. He said, it's such a poorly drafted bill that we ought, we ought to do is go back and correct all these problems before we start playing around with something that can't be enforced anyway. And the surprise was these objections hadn't been raised until the absolute last moment. Then a number of members of council that we had counted on decided to explore, uh, explain their votes. The first of these was Maury Portman, who had been former president of city council, and um, he, decided, he got very upset with equation of people who were homophobic with the Nazis, and he decided to say a word about that, and it follows immediately on my, my clip here, with Arlene Shoemaker, who had been widely touted, as I said in the press, the Republican going to vote for this, explaining why she could not do so. And as part of her explanation, she has one of the most interesting slips of the tongue I have ever heard, you have to listen for it. She means to say we do not have a clear ordinance, she says, queer, unfortunately, and then manages to correct herself. Here is that. Mr. President, yes, Mr. Parker, I feel it's a statement that I have to make. I resent equation of Nazism with this issue. <laughs> just, just to make an historical point, Adolf Hitler's closest buddies were homosexual. I'd like to take a minute and explain my vote. I also believe very strongly in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And I also believe when I took my oath of office that I swore to represent all the people of Columbus. I cannot vote the way I'd like to vote, so I'm going to say no, because I believe we do not have a clear, clear cut piece of legislation that will cause anything but unhappiness. <laughs> the press and the gay community was down in the dumps because we'd had a very public humiliation and it became clear we were going to have problems ever getting it through city council and there was another complication under the laws of the city of Columbus if there is ever a referendum on a something that's passed by city council and the referendum defeats the ordinance it can never be introduced again instead it would have to be reintroduced by a referendum and we were very worried, given that kind of climate, that the referendum would be filed. It has to be filed within 30 days of the ordinance being adopted, 
So we didn't know how to get around that problem. On the other hand, because this was such a terrible public event, it also, good happens to come with bad too. Uh, when you lose battles, frequently it energizes people, and a lot of people were furious over this, came out of the closet and wanted to join Stonewall and push for things. And, um, uh, you know, in the meantime, we were all battling oh, the antagonism, because suddenly we were all over the newspapers and on television, and this was much run, and we had to deal with death threats. Um, here's how I dealt with death threats. I learned how to handle death threats from my mother. Um, <laughs> my father was a prosecutor in Dallas, Texas, and he was, this will surprise you, not a shy, quiet person. He was uh, wonderful in the courtroom, and he was very good at putting people in jail, and they promoted him to the point where he was prosecuting career criminals. That's the mafia. And that's how my mother would get death threats, uh, arguing that he ought to quit what he was doing. And she said to me, Duck, what you do, you hit the cradle of the phone a couple of times, and you say, Operator, this is one of those calls, please trace it. And she says, they hang up instantly. And the opposite hop happened of what they planned on. They called to scare you. So we had to deal with those sorts of things. Um, there was, however, a gay pride march not long after that city council battle. And suddenly we had a huge march. I mean, there were lots of people suddenly marching, and they were all angry. And uh, we were all talking about that ordinance and uh, the various other incidents I mentioned, the John Blaine's problem and so forth. And um, I got dragged out once again to talk to the crowd, and I thought I'd give you a little snippet of me yelling at the crowd on the State House lawn, and this is June of 84, the same year as the ordinance. The lesbians and gays of Michigan, Ohio, and surrounding states, I bid you welcome to the third gay pride parade. And you're 
organization failing. So 1984 was a key moment in the history of the organization. It became the principal organization in the state. Indeed, we were copied widely in other cities. At one point, we had the, uh, they were organizing down in Cincinnati, and they wanted to call themselves Stonewall Union Cincinnati, and they could ask us if we could use their name. And I said, why not? And Robert Haberkamp, who's sitting over here, said to me, well, if they wanted to use the name Douglas Whaley, would you let them do that? I said, no, you're right. We forbade them. So they became Stonewall Cincinnati. Uh, therefore, it's so ironic when we eventually changed our name to Stonewall Columbus. You know, we, 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 had, we had gone to do the same sort of thing that Cincinnati <coughs> did. Um, we established a community center. Rhonda warned us that was going to be a dangerous thing to do because it's such a financial burden that uh, you'd better be able to make sure that you can sustain it, and we did. We had lots of other battles going on that I don't have time for, and again, there are famous people in the room in these battles that I would like to, to uh, recognize. I should again mention one of the straights, however, that helped us out so much, Mary Jo Kilroy, who's one of our students here at the law school. I taught that woman contracts many years ago. She eventually was on the, uh, the school board here in Columbus, and she fought valiantly and hard from the very beginning uh, to protect school teachers from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. She is now one of our Franklin County Commissioners, along with Arlene Shoemaker. I'll bet the two of them have interesting discussions. Uh, there are hundreds of gay organizations out there, and in Columbus we've got one of the largest lists in the country of gay organizations. Uh, everything from things like uh, Bravo, the Buckeye Region Anti-Violence Organization, down to the Bowling League, which I believe has the largest organization in the state for uh, active members who turn up at their, their routine events. Um, and let me move on to another issue that I'll bet will surprise many people in this room. This is a list taken from the program of two years ago of the presidents of Stonewall Union, and it's accurate except for Rob Berger, who follows uh, Susan White on this list. And the one I want to talk about, and the first one I want to talk about, is Chris Kozak. Now, Chris Kozak, you'll notice on this list, is 1988-89. She was the first person who had the temerity to run twice uh, to become the president of Stonewall. Uh, everyone else, Rhonda, myself, and everyone else had burned out after one year, but Chris Kozad, who is, uh, we owe an awful lot to Chris, too, um, she managed to run it for two years. And here is a picture of Chris. Uh, she's the one sitting closest to you, and her lover, Gloria McCauley, who is sitting on the, uh, behind her there and standing as their child, Kalen. Uh, Chris and uh, Gloria now run Bravo, that Buckeye anti-violence program. But you will notice that the year 1990 mentions Russ Stock slash Chris Cosette. Now what in the world is that about? Here is what it about, uh, came about. Um, Russ Stock became the president of the organization and, and we later learned that we should ask more questions about the people who are going to be the president of the organization <laughs> because he was promptly arrested for rape. Uh, before I, I should mention a couple of things. You, when he was arrested, we well, had a major, mer, a major meeting in Stonewall, of course, because here's our president, arrested for <coughs> rape as part of what was a, supposedly an S&M scene that went awry, and the uh, person filed a complaint against him. And then it came out that he had spent four years in jail for child molestation. So we had a big meeting at Stonewall. What do we do about the, the rust problem? And of course, we don't want to say he's guilty, because for all we knew, he wasn't guilty, and he protested and said that this was all consensual activity that had gone on. And we, uh, we had a meeting, and they ended up putting uh, Chris Kozet. They asked her to become president once again, because she'd been at the helm for so long, so suddenly here she is back in the presidency. And they dragged out Rhonda and I. We hadn't been doing much at this stage. This is 1992. 1990. Look at your notes, Douglas, yes. Um, yeah, it's 1990, and the, uh, so they dragged us out, and we were all over the press again, and here is, I'm sitting on one side, and Rhonda's sitting on the other, and Chris Kozak in the middle, 
And here's what the press coverage fair has always looked like in those days. It is a crime of violence. It is not a gay crime. That is the word from the Stonewall Union tonight in the wake of the arrest of its president on rape charges. Russell Stock, the leader of the gay rights group, resigned his presidency yesterday after being arraigned on charges of binding and raping a young Newark man. And today, leaders of Stonewall said that they were concerned that Stock accepted a leadership position with the organization without revealing his criminal record. He spent four years in prison for the rape of a 12-year-old boy. Now, Stonewall hopes sensationalism does not overshadow justice. Whenever something bad happens that happens to be done by gay people, and there's a certain proportion of gay people in society, then it's sensationalized and becomes something that all gay people do. Uh, we don't say because the mayor is an adulterer that all heterosexual males are adulterers. We don't say because a certain congressman uh, has sexual relationships with young ladies under 16 that all heterosexual male congressmen have those kind of behaviors. Uh, but people want to generalize about gay people. Stonewall has not been asked to take any official part in Stock's defense. Well. Russell Stock eventually was acquitted. He never took the stand, so it didn't come out about his past criminal record. And I don't know what, what happened to him, but um, Rhonda was very clever there. Was, the mayor had had some very public problems, and so had one of our congressmen. And so Rhonda wanted to drag those out and make sure that everybody knew about that one. Um, it came time to battle the ordinance again. And this is the effort uh, that... Uh, occurred in 1992. By this time, Cindy Lazarus, another of the heroes of the gay community who is straight, had become president of city council. And Rhonda and a lot of other people decided, uh, and I see some of them sitting in the room, there was a, com uh, a committee formed to see what we could do about the ordinance. Elliot Fishman uh, was the head of the committee, and there were a lot of people on it. Let's see it. Ed Pfeiffer was the uh, president of Stonewall in those days, and people like Marianne Neal and Steve Schellefarger and Phil, were you on this one? Where is it? Where did Phil go? Phil, were you on that? In that group too, Phil Pizzatelli and the, uh, uh, let's see, Jerry Bungie, who was my lover, Todd Anglin and Ed Tomczak, who owned the Eagle, and they were all involved in these things. And the idea was that see if we could get it through city council. We had a new mayor, Greg Lasheka, also a graduate of this institution. He was a Republican, and he had been the city attorney at the time of the 84 battle when he was not particularly supportive. But we sent Rhonda off to talk to him. And you know, again, you did not say no to this woman. And it turned out that the mayor had gay neighbors. And he said, look, he said, I'll sign the ordinance if you pass it. But there can't be the kind of big public brouhaha that we had back in 84. It's got to be quiet before I'll sign it. So then the question was, how do we do it uh, quietly? And the idea that came about that the various lawyers involved uh, came up with is, let's go back and create, uh, solve the problems that Ben Espy had been bothered back in 84. Let's revamp the whole enforcement mechanism, rewrite all the civil rights ordinances, and just slip sexual orientation in there without talking about it. So it was a surreptitious uh, passing of the ordinance that we decided to do in 1992. And my then lover, Jerry Bungie, whose picture was up here before, is the person who drafted the actual language of the ordinance. And again, there was a lot of pressure put on city council. And Cindy uh, Lazarus, who was the president of the council, was walking around and making sure we had all the ducks in a row and that everybody would vote for it. By this time, the only Republican left on the council was Arlene Shoemaker. She was still there. And she said, I will be out of town on the day that you vote. And uh, so that's exactly what happened. Um, the uh, council passed the ordinance on Monday, June 8, 1992. And now we have to wait out the 30-day period before that uh, for a referendum, because if that happens, we're in real trouble. So have we downplayed everything. And of course, because this was early in June, June 8, well, the Gay Pride March is about to happen in that same month in 1992. And we knew about it at Stonewall, but we, we swore everybody to secrecy. No one is allowed to mention it at Gay Pride that we got this through, because we were worried about that referendum. Nothing happened. Uh, Clyde Huffman, who was Cindy Lazarus's aide, had to field angry phone calls about queers, and that was about the only thing. And it, it just it, it got into law, and we managed uh, to finally get that ordinance through after the battles from '73 and the battle in '84, and finally in '92 it passed.
Well, burnout occurs for the people battling. You know, they fall by the wayside and let other people go ahead and handle this thing. My involvement stopped uh, in the early 90s, as I say, with Stonewall, though I got dragged back into it by Nancy Rogers, who is the now the dean of the law school. She was vice provost in the year 2000, had me appointed to the diversity committee, and I got involved in those domestic partner kind of battles, but that's a story for another day. Uh, in the 2001 Gay Pride celebration, as I said, it was the 20th anniversary of Stonewall, and the, um, they decided that they were going to honor the 20 people, as I say, who were important in Stonewall's history, and uh, I got a phone call and asked would I be willing to come down and uh, ride in the parade, and I assumed they were going to put us on a bus or something, or a float, you know, and have us wave. No, 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 they put us on in Cadillacs, um, open Cadillacs like this. Now, that's a 1969 Cadillac DeVille. The Lambda Car Club had all these cars. And I was supposed to ride with Craig Covey. That's what it says on the side, Douglas Whaley and Craig Covey, but he couldn't make it either. He was at the Michigan parade, parade up in Lansing. And uh, they put me on the back of this, this, and it took an hour to get downtown. And it turned out that if you want to put me on the back of a Cadillac and ride me in triumph through the, city, the streets of the city I live in, I can take a lot of that. And uh, I did a great deal of waving and so forth. Uh, and, and, and there was occasional sporadic applause, and I assumed it was for me till it occurred to me a lot of it was for the car. Uh, which had people come up and stroke the car, and uh, I had an epiphany riding in that parade. The city was festooned with rainbow flag banners, and the next day we were scheduled to meet with Mayor Coleman at the Stonewall brunch, and I thought to myself, wait a minute, 20 years ago, the mayor and the city, that's who we were battling. That was those were the enemies, and the Columbus Dispatch wasn't our friend. Uh, the Columbus Dispatch was hugely homophobic. And it suddenly occurred to me that we had won the battle for public acceptance. And that was a shock. I mean, we've still got lots of battles to fight. I mean, AIDS is still out there, and we've got the military, and we've got the marriage issues, and so forth. I don't mean the battles are over, but the battles that we were fighting 20 years ago for, for to not be perverts, for it to be okay for people like me to stand up in front of a classroom and teach the students, those battles are over. And nowadays, I don't even think about being gay. I don't hide it in any way. If I'm on an airplane and talking to someone and it casually comes up that I'm gay, I mention it. If they can't handle it, I don't think of it as my problem. But in the early days, we were terrified. Let me tell you about my first meeting with Rhonda Rivera. She joined the faculty, and I asked her out to lunch because I wanted to tell her I was gay. She thought I was hitting on her. And uh, when she tells this story, she says, I scrunched up on the other side of the car, and I wanted to take her out away from the university, so I took her to, uh, was a Hilton that had a restaurant? She's like, he's taking me to a hotel. <laughs> and we're driving, I was driving in the car, and I said, are you aware that you and I share a common social difficulty? She said, no. I said, I'm gay. She said, oh, thank goodness. She said, okay. <laughs> and I'm gay, too, and we had a very long lunch. But in the course of this lunch, now this is 1976, and she has just joined the faculty, and I've uh, just been on it since January. And I said to her, if the dean calls us into the office and asks, are we gay, will we tell? And to show you what a very different era it was, I can't remember how that conversation came out, whether we said yes or we said no. But in any event, it was huge fun writing on this. And when I hit the, uh, the, uh, the people with their Bibles and so forth, a lot of them would break ranks and come right up to the car. Well, I couldn't because I couldn't, I couldn't be loud enough to get the crowd going. And he, these people I was marching with, at one point I said, well, let's get chance going. And, and they were pathetic. I said, boy, we'd have taken away your queer card uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> so when the protesters would come rushing up to the car, I couldn't think what to do, so I decided to wink at them. And, you know, you wink at somebody. I'm here to tell you they did not like being winked at. Um, and uh, that worked. Well, I suggest that in the gay community, we ought to have a major public acceptance party. And I'm thinking about writing an article and sending it off to the advocate, saying that it's time to celebrate these various victories before they slip by without worry, uh, finding out that they happen. I think we also, and I think Stonewall, Kate and Stormy are uh, getting around to this sort of thing, ought to have an oral history project. I think that we, people ought to tell their stories. Someone ought to go down to Albuquerque, where Rhonda and her great lover, Margaret Morris, are, and get their stories, because Rhonda certainly has got stories to tell. And Craig Covey, who's up in Detroit, and Val, and all the people who were sitting around who fought these battles, and people who were here before uh, the Stonewall and, uh, period that I have talked about, and what used to happen in the days where um, 
there used to be rent busting parties because when the bars closed, it was your time to have everyone over to your house and then you would lose your apartment because you had a party and it was discovered that you were gay. I mean, that was pretty routine. When I first started coming to the city, the old timers, when they stepped out of the bars, they looked both ways because they were terrified of the cops and, and we've come a long way. As I started the lecture, I said there were hundreds of people, and some of them, again, are sitting in this room, whose names I haven't mentioned, and we owe them all a lot. Uh, but when I look at what Stonewall Columbus has become, uh, what a miracle its existence is, how very far we've come from the Stonewall riots in 1969, uh, I get a lump in my throat. There's, this has been a, a, quite a battle, and I thank you all for coming tonight and letting me tell it to you.